Welcome to People in Profit. This week we're taking a step back for a look at the bigger picture for the global economy. The sun is setting on capitalism, or so says my guest. Jeremy Rifkin is an economic and social theorist. He's advised the European Union, European governments, and even the Chinese administration as well. Uh, Jeremy Rifkin, thank you very much for speaking to us. My pleasure. Uh, what is eclipsing capitalism for you? Well, capitalism is not going to disappear, but it's already being completely transformed in ways that um, we've not been able to imagine previously. Let me step back for a moment. GDP has been slowing all over the world now for 20 years. And the reason that's happening is productivity has been declining all over the, the world for those last 20 years. And our economic forecasters are projecting 20 more years of low productivity and slow growth. The problem, millennial generation can't find a foothold in a 21st century workforce. Uh, now that, that economic crisis is compounded by the growing inequality in the world. Uh, while half the human race is doing a lot better than before we started the industrial age and the other half that's making two dollars a day or less are only appreciably better, the very rich have really taken it in. Uh, on the other hand, after two industrial revolutions in the 19th and 20th century, we're now saddled with real-time climate change. And our scientists are telling us that we are now in the sixth extinction event of life on Earth, and it doesn't make the headlines. I'm sure this will be news to everyone that's watching what I'm saying here. We're not going to reverse climate change. It's going to be with us for thousands of years. It's going to change civilization. But we may be able to survive and we flourish our species and our fellow creatures. So the key here is to look back at how the great economic paradigm shifts occur. That's going to give us a roadmap and compass in what we need to do. And this is very interesting anthropologically. If you look at all the seven or so major economic paradigm shifts in history, they all share a common denominator. At a moment of time, three defining technologies will emerge in a civilization and converge to create an infrastructure that fundamentally transforms the way we manage power and move economic, social life, and governance. Communication revolutions to more efficiently manage our economic and social life, governance. New four sources of energy to more efficiently power our economic and social life and governance. And third, new modes of transportation logistics to more efficiently move our economic, social, and governing life. When communication revolutions, new energy regimes, new mobility and logistics infrastructure come together, it changes our temporal spatial orientation, our business models, our governance. And now you feel the internet is really at the center of what that's I mean, going to change. Yeah, I mean, if you look, and we can do it in 40 years. I mean, the first industrial revolution in Britain we came in in 40 years. They went to steam power printing and communication. They put out the telegraph system. They went to coal for their new energy source. They put the steam engine on rails for locomotives and transport. They did it in 40, 50 years. And in America, in the second industrial revolution, uh, uh, the telephone, centralized electricity, we introduced that. And we went to cheap Texas oil for our energy. And Henry Ford put in the internal combustion engine and the highway and road systems came in. We did it in 40 years. But arguably, the world's population is much bigger now, and the infrastructure that exists is much bigger to dismantle at the same time as well. well it's a difficulty, but the third industrial revolution can move very, very quickly. It's a digital revolution. So uh, what we're seeing is the, the internet is here. That's a communication revolution. Three and a half billion people connected at the speed of light, uh, changing everything the way we deal with uh, uh, virtual information, news, knowledge, entertainment. And now that communication in, uh, revolution, the internet, is converging with a digitalized renewable energy internet. We have now millions of people now in Europe and now in China beginning to produce their own solar and wind electricity where they live. And what they don't need, they're sharing it back on an electricity grid that's digitalized and acts just like the communication internet. So you share energy across continents the way you share information digitally for your news, knowledge, social blogs, Wikipedia, or whatever. Now these two internets in Europe and China are now converging with a digitalized, automated transportation logistics internet made of electric and fuel cell vehicles, 3D printed. And these vehicles are going to be on automated, driverless, road, rail, water, and air systems in the next 10 years. So those three internets for communication, energy, and mobility, digital energy, digital transport, digital communication, the final component is they're riding on top of an emerging Internet of Things platform mm. where we're laying out sensors across the entire built environment, agricultural fields. We have little sensors monitoring the growth of the crops. Factories are monitoring uh, the assembly line, smart homes, smart vehicles, smart warehouses. And they're sending that data increasingly to this emerging communication, energy, and mobility infrastructure 
so that we can all better manage power and move our economic and social life. So it's a big leap forward. We could connect all of humanity in this kind of nervous system over the next generation or two and have a vast expansion of social entrepreneurialism. That's the upside. The downside is the dark net, which is menacing. Uh, and it's where challenges like cybersecurity become even more important. Well, first you start with network neutrality. What's gonna, how are we going to ensure governments don't take over this and purloin it for political purposes? This is happening. Or internet companies commodifying our data for commercial purposes, and we become, if you will, a commodity ourselves in their hands. Uh, data security, privacy, cybercrime, cyber terrorism, malware. So the key is to create this third industrial revolution infrastructure so it's so distributed that any attack, whether it be climate change or cyber attack, anywhere allows everyone else to go off the system, decentralize, go on their own, re-aggregate, so that you wouldn't have enough malware to take down the system. But the upside of the Internet of Things platform is we can move to a new stage of globalization, globalization where people are directly engaging each other all over the world. And when you speak to governments, as you do on a regular basis, are, this is a very stark warning for them. Are they receptive to this? You speak to European governments regularly. Well, uh, I was privileged to work with the European Union uh, over the last 17 years, first with Romano Prati, who was president of the commission, and then the Manuel Barroso's commission, and now uh, um, Mr. Juncker's commission. And uh, we have a plan uh, that I've uh, been working on alongside many others in Europe called Smart Europe. Mero Sefcovic is the vice president of the European Commission in charge of Smart Europe, the Energy Union. And actually, he's also co-chair with uh, former Mayor Michael Bloomberg of Global Covenant Cities. Mm -hmm. So uh, last year, uh, Mero Sefcovic uh, joined with the Committee of the Regions of Europe, introduced the third industrial revolution, Smart Europe. I was privileged to join in that conversation. We have a Juncker Fund of 740 billion euros. Much of that can go to local regions to customize this infrastructure to their region, then cross border mm. with regions across Europe. But that's a slow process as well, getting that funding to into a project and getting the infrastructure up. That's that's a problem. But let's look at Halle de France. Okay, I'm sure you're very aware of the miracle in Halle de France. My global team, TR Consulting, was asked by the president of the region to come in. That's the Rust Belt. A lot of young people were leaving, jobs disappearing, business not doing well six years ago. And I said, our team will come in, but you have to make the plan based on the architecture. You have to roll up your sleeves, bring in every municipality, bring in all the universities, the high schools, bring in the whole business community, and you do the plan, we'll help you. I was amazed. They were amazed. In five years, they've become the lead entrepreneurial region in Europe. They won the award as the lead entrepreneurial region. They've created thousands of jobs. They have trained grandchildren of coal miners that are retrofitting buildings, putting in solar. They have high-tech parks there. And they're now moving to escalate the scale to this whole infrastructure revolution. This is the industrial rust belt in the third biggest region of France. So I have been totally impressed by the French uh, stamina, the resilience. I, I guess there's so much resilience in some of these regions. They said, well, we're going to do it. And how does, how does that compare then to the approach in China? China is very interesting because I, I was privileged to work with the leadership in China uh, when Premier Li came into office. He said he had read the book Third Industrial Revolution and instructed the central government to move on the narratives I'm discussing with you. Uh, I then uh, have been traveling back and forth, working with uh, various federal agencies there, uh, various state agencies there, excuse me. Uh, they moved very quick. After my first visit, 11 weeks later, the chairperson of the state electricity grid, the national grid, the state grid, announced $82 billion to completely digitalize the electricity grid, the state grid, so that millions of Chinese people could buy solar and wind technology from their own companies because they're the biggest producers, place it on site, and then share surplus energy back on an energy internet, just like they share information now on their communication yeah. internet. They move really quickly. And are there countries that aren't listening? The United States? United States. And what can be done about that? Uh, I think that there's a, it's one of those uh, anomalies in history. Uh, we didn't see this coming. Uh, President Trump, uh, is in office. He's taking us back to 1950. He wants to put back coal and oil and natural gas. These are all stranded industries. Uh, everybody in the uh, power business knows that the coal, oil, and gas are stranded assets. Citibank did a report mm -hmm. saying we have $100 trillion in stranded assets because solar and wind are now moving to parity, and they're going to be below parity, and they're already outcompeting these old uh, energies. But in the US, the current administration is moving back to a 1950s uh, image. What I'm afraid is going to happen 
is that we could end up being a second tier country in less than 20 years, second tier. Now, there are pockets. For example, we did a plan with San Antonio, our global group, and now across Texas, they're doing wind turbines, they love it. Uh, if you so this at, comes back to localism again. It's, that's right, so what's happening is, you have to, to take a look at the shift in political power, always look at the technology infrastructure you introduce. That'll tell you how the political governance will happen. For example, the first and second industrial revolution infrastructures was designed to be centralized, top down, intellectually enclosed with intellectual property, vertically integrated to scale to get returns to the investors. So your governance had to be somewhat like that. But the third industrial revolution infrastructure, the actual architecture, if you don't try to monopolize it and cripple it, it's designed, as every digital native knows, every millennial, it's designed to be distributed, open, transparent. You can't get the network in effect if it's controlled by intellectual property and close. And you laterally scale it. The more in the network, the more everyone benefits. So it favors localities and regions, and it favors a new form of globalization, globalization. Instead of four or 500 companies uh, uh, being responsible for 23% of the GDP of the world, now, with the digital it's internet more, crossing the world, sure, and... you can, every region, both virtually and physically, can engage every other region of the world with business opportunities, with low fixed and marginal cost, and create a lateral globalization that brings every region of the world into a more just and equitable and sustainable planet. This is what I think is starting to happen. It's beginning, but well, how to France shows me if they can do this, and Rotterdam and The Hague can do this, and Little Luxembourg can do this, Every region of the world can do that. Okay, an element of hope to finish on. Jeremy Rifkin, thank you very much for speaking to us. Thank you to you for watching. That's the end of this program, but plenty more news coming up on France 24. Do stay with us. Kobani, a small predominantly Kurdish town on the Syrian border with Turkey. In July 2014, the Islamic State Organization tries to capture it. The Kurdish forces of the YPG, supported by the International Coalition, manage to cling on, but Kobani is left in ruins. Today, after the horrors they have endured, what are the people of Kobani doing to ensure their future and that of their children? Kobani revisited all this week on France 24 and France24.com.